and welcome to another issue of the Ghostlight Social. This is the show we all know by now, I've not even touched my head yet, um, where we get creative people together, we have a bit of a chat, we have a bit of a chinwag, we put the world to rights, we give ourselves hope and we banish our fears. So just to let everybody know, um, we're just sort of struggling to get one of the guests on, which is a bit of a shame. Good. Okay, look, let's, um, while we're still trying to figure out how to get Marie on the call, let's uh, let's introduce our other guest. Yes who we're very lucky to have with us. Actor, Saba Nikufa Fekr. Perfect. <laughs> no, it wasn't perfect. It was, it was. <laughs> How are we, Saba? Yeah, just saying, just getting used to things, really. Um, at first, it was a bit hard, but after a while, you just get used to the things, you know, the way they are now. So I've, I've been okay, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good, yeah, because yeah, it's um it's tricky at the best of times. And one of the one of the reasons that I was really keen to get you on as well, um, was because you're a recent grad. But we have been talking a lot about you know what we fear, and when I say we, I mean actors that potentially are already working and already have a foothold in the industry, and how at the moment a lot of people feel really disconnected. So yeah, I graduated last year and I signed with a really good agent. So. Um, she's been sending me off for, you know, really good auditions. Um, and at first it's kind of hard to get used to either not hearing back or getting your nose. Um, but then you just, you just sort of learn to sort of cope with that. I think everyone's got their own way of coping. You can either cry for a few minutes and then get on with it or just sort of forget that you've done the audition. But during lockdown, what I've been doing is loads of monologue competitions online. Um, I think Twitter is a brilliant platform for actors and there's loads of opportunities on Twitter. So that's how I've been sort of keeping in the loop with my acting. Yeah, f fair enough. Um, yeah. I have Mike's got a little grin on his face because you mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned the magic monologue word. Um, but I'll come back to that in a moment. Okay. Good, thank you, Saba. <laughs> Marie! Hello! Hello, hello. Oh, hello, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it's absolutely not your fault. I should have checked that account before I sent you all the information over. Because I didn't think for one minute it would be locked. No. Why would it be locked? <laughs> oh, thank you. At least I don't know how to use it now, which is great. <laughs> Brilliant. How are you? How are things? I I'm good, thank you. It's lovely to see you all. Nice to meet you. <laughs> And how's, lock how's lockdown been? How have you been coping? Do you know what? I've quite enjoyed it <laughs> in a bizarre way. It's um, perfectly reasonable. Do you know what I mean? It's sometimes it's quite nice to stop and just begin to look up a bit and just um, stop rushing around and um, thinking about things that are important and just start to live your life a bit really <laughs> okay look let's just jump straight in um do you have it i'll stick with you marie if that's all right do you have a song for our yes, isolation playlist oh well i don't know so much a song but um i think it's going going into my kind of thing of, of calm and peace and all that stuff um very late in life i kind of uh very late in life, but very late in my you know in my adulthood if you like i discovered um just classical music and listening to classical music and um one of my favorite um pieces of music is born williams uh fantasia on thomas tallis so that's one of my favorites it's just beautiful and uplifting and calming and genius so well when you said lockdown i just thought of the song stuck in the middle with you i think it's still oh, real yeah <laughs> it's a good uh, song thank you that is, is that Steely Dan? Great song. Steeler's Wheel, I think. Steeler's Wheel. Steeler's yeah. Wheel, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 great song. For obvious it's in reasons. Reservoir Dogs, isn't it? Is it yeah. what, sorry? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's in Reservoir Dogs, I think, isn't it? Yeah. 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 It is. He's dancing, yeah. It's quite a thing. The bit where he um, cups the, the ear thing. off. Is it that? Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> is, is there any is there any other reason that song um than than obviously the the obvious just the obvious really to be honest it's, it just came to my head and i thought i'll stick with that it's the first thing that popped in my head it's a good job <laughs> that, yeah, yeah. Good job. Great song. that'll do for me um while i'm with you then um most coronavirus thing you've done I'm trying to think something that i wouldn't have done so like the classic 
Go on. I've done quite a bit of baking. I, I, I haven't baked in a long time. And I guess I jumped on the bandwagon of baking. But um, What have you been nothing, baking? Nothing special. You know, those pre-made little kits that you can get. Like the cupcake a, things? Yeah. And then you whack an egg in. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> no, do you know what? Yeah. Do you know what? I once, I've got a confession to make. <laughs> I, I once won a baking competition. Right. It was only like a little thing. It wasn't like a massive thing. With, yeah. with one of the with a pack of those pre-made. Oh my god! <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way to do it. <laughs> Having done a couple of pub quizzes with you, Lee, I can well believe this. <laughs> of it wasn't because I just thought, oh well, everybody's doing it, so I'm going to have to do it. And then I thought, oh, I, d- I can't bake, so I just bought one of them, threw it all together, didn't expect, and it, and it won. And it sort of, at that point, you can't sort of go. Oh, um, Sorry. Uh... <laughs> did you say? Did you tell everyone that it was pre-made? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> no, not at that, <laughs> not... <laughs> no. Not that point. No, Jack. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so you've not been um, not been on the banana bread or anything like that. Just the. No, you know what? I did actually attempt it, but I didn't have the right flour, so it just yeah went straight in the bin. <laughs> it wasn't nice at all. Did you not um, have... When you say you didn't have the right flour, what did you try to use? So just plain flour, but it says you need self-raising flour, so it was kind of really flat. I thought I'd just give it a go and see if it works, but no, <laughs> it didn't work. How is your cooking generally? Are you are you a cook? I do like cooking, yeah. Okay. I love trying new things as well. Um, I'm always up for trying new things. Um, I'm trying to learn how to make Persian food because my mum's honestly an incredible cook, and she makes every single Persian dish you name it she can make it and mine isn't as good but i'm trying to get there i'm trying to learn very good yes i wish i wish i could cook i'm a terrible terrible cook (laughs) i can warm stuff up really well i'm really good i don't i just don't i I genuinely just don't get the you know the sort of mixing flavors i just don't i think it's i think it's wizardry when you taste something that's been cooked by someone that really knows what they're talking about and it just got all the taste and stuff. I'm sure your mum's food's exactly the same. You just go, yeah. how do you do that from scratch? Yeah. <laughs> I know. And it's when they put different things together that you'd never think of putting together and then you're like, wow, like this really mm. works. It's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's weird. Like um, I realised quite recently, like I've always known how to cook you know regular food you know what i mean like i'll do a cheese sauce from scratch or i'll do a bolognese from scratch or you know i could right. do a roast dinner yeah, quite easily do all you know yorkshire puddings and that like a proper bat and all that kind of stuff just kind of standard food and i quite recently realized that i really like it i really like standing and chopping yeah. stuff and i really yeah. like the whole process and i have a podcast on and I'm in my kitchen and I'm sharpening my knife and I just really get into it. And it is that one thing where I can just switch off and that's all I'm bothered about. And to the point now where it's coming up to Father's Day and then there'll be like Christmas and my birthday, which will be well after lockdown. So hopefully we'll have some more money. Um, let's hope. Let's yeah. hope. And so I've started laying hints on a stand mixer for Christmas. <laughs> What's a yeah. stand mixer? So. Yeah. It's like um, it's like an L-shaped thing. It kind of stands like that and comes across. And then there's like yeah. a paddle, and you can switch the paddle out so you can do, um, you know, you can do dough with it, or you can do cake mixes with it, or you can whisk stuff with it. And there's like a big bowl. But there's one I want, which you could grind your own meat with it. Oh. Yeah. To, to make mincemeat, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And, cause I've been... Is it not just easier just to buy mincemeat? Yeah, but... <laughs> When you're creating like your own hamburgers, um, you need your own eighty twenty blend of particular cuts of beef. Yeah, yeah. So, and I've become a little bit obsessed with uh, two YouTube channels, binging with Babish. I recommend for everybody who is just mm. one of the best cooks in the world. And this dude is a VFX artist who decided to learn to cook and do it on YouTube. And he's got like 10 million subscribers now. He's amazing. And there's um, First We Feast, which is a bit more of a connoisseur, kind of a they go around and taste food and stuff. And there's a guy on that um, who, who does the burger show. And 
it's just amazing like these little tiny little standalone burger joints in the middle of nowhere in texas and they make this particular burger which they've been doing for 80 years and recipes never change and if you ask for sauce you get kicked out and all that and i've just i love it it's great brilliant yeah. well uh, marie's nodding away and sort of making yeah. all sorts of noises so t- tell us oh, about yeah. your cul- cul- culinary activities well do you know what i'm i'm, I'm not a, a, a brilliant cook i'm trying to teach myself to be better um but i do i've enjoyed it it's exactly like what mike was saying there, there comes a point where you sort of just having a bit of time to do something take your time and just try and get better at something and put flavors together but i wouldn't say i was any expert whatsoever you know i just try and i just get some recipes usually off bbc food follow them and then see what happens but i'm getting more confident it's just that yeah. nice thing of just it's a bit it's mindful really isn't it yeah cooking yeah it's uh yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. great. And I've, I've bought a food processor and it's been the best thing ever because you just chop onions and stuff in it in a minute and stuff like that. <laughs> well, and this is really coronavirus. Yeah. But um, I decided I needed to exercise. And um, I've always loved the idea of yoga, but every time I start it, I get really bored. I just, my mind wanders. Um, I don't know. I'm just not very good at it. Um, but I went on the, um, my daughter bought me this fire stick for Christmas, you know, the Amazon thing. So I can get YouTube up on the telly and we've got a big telly. And um, I discovered Pilates videos. So I've discovered Pilates. I've been doing that every day. Oh. So you know what, I feel I, very I, hamstered mum, you know. Uh, <laughs> the, thing, the thing about Pilates is, um, when I was a member of the gym, but I don't, I don't do that stuff anymore. <laughs> I, used, I used to go to the Pilates classes. It's brilliant. Uh, and actually... It's good, it get it it can get a little bit tricky. It's a it's a bit sort of you know it's, you think it's you know old women sort of you, you yeah. know and it's yeah. you know having said that I mean I used to do body pump and there, there were lots of very elderly I would say elderly women and men lifting <laughs> twice as much as I was. Um, so so yeah, I'm definitely up for the Pilates. I thought mm. you was good. You, you when you were talking about the yoga, I thought you were gonna and you said you know your mind starts wandering. I thought you were gonna t- talk about the meditative yoga. You know where you get where they give you a, your mm. own mantra and you just. Oh, you see, mm, no, you see, I'm just not there with it. I feel like when I watch Ricky Gervais, have you seen Afterlife? Yeah. yeah. I've seen that brilliant second series where he goes and the guy's trying to be all, <laughs> and he just can't <laughs> deal with it. I get it. <laughs> I get it. I just get distracted and uh, I'm just start looking around and think I should be really, really relaxing here and be in the moment. And I'm just not. <laughs> and, uh, so, yeah, but Pilates, I think because it's, it's, it feels very systematic, doesn't it? You know, it, it feels um, less zen and more doing. I don't know. Yeah. What was the last thing you said to an audience? Yeah, I, I did cold feet at the beginning of the year. So that's and I also did um, a voiceover for Network Rail. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I think the last one, I think it might have been the cold feet. They're very close to each other, I think. Oh, I, wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't remember the Network Rail last line. But um, I'm sure along the lines with the, with the cold feet one, it was something along the lines of, I can't remember, something like, we're here for you or something like that. I can't remember. Something like that. <laughs> okay, that could have been the network rail. Oh, well. It could, yeah, well, could well have been. Absolutely. <laughs> and BBC Three has come back into its own, hasn't it? It, it? I think there was a doubt about it. And now with things like normal people, be, people begin to really see the um, its, its currency. And it's it, it does produce some great dramas, that, that particular channel. So it'd be great if it did. Would uh, ordinary, yeah. Yeah, ordinary people's an interesting one because... Oh, I, oh sorry, I, normal people. Did I get that wrong then? Normal people. Sorry, it was me got it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I thought you said normal people. Did you say something? Yeah. Oh, oh, sorry. Um, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. Um, normal people's an interesting one because that they bumped that to BBC One, didn't they? Yeah. Am I right in saying that? It, wasn't, it was never supposed to be on BBC One. It's on, yeah. it's mm. on Hulu and BBC, I think. Right. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Because... Yeah. Because it's interesting, the because I've I've not seen it yet, and it's on the list to watch. I've not seen it yet, but everybody's saying how wonderful it is, um, and I, and I just wonder if if lockdown hadn't have happened, whether that show would be as big as it is. Mm. I wonder whether it's benefited from that. I think, yeah, mm. it is. It's interesting. I do think it's extraordinary. I have to say, 
I think the the acting, the directing, um, the, the 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 actual script is just beautiful. Mm. Uh, it, it is it is phenomenal. Um, so who knows? But I, I take your point. But it's um, it's a it's a great piece of work. I think. Yeah, I totally agree. Like the acting is incredible from every cast member. I mean, watching it, you're either shouting at the screen or you're crying or you're laughing. Yeah. Just it hits you so much. I remember after I finished watching it, I couldn't stop thinking about it for yeah. weeks. Do you know what I mean? It was just yeah. one of those that that impacts you so much. And I watched it because everyone started posting about it, and I thought, okay, I'll I'll see what this is about. And I was just hooked straight away. And I think, yeah, the actors are they're, they're just incredible. The characters they are. are just, and it's so natural as well. Sometimes you watch it and you're like, oh wow, that they're, they're acting, but it just it doesn't feel like they're acting, if that makes sense. It does. It's amazing. It's, it's, yeah. I think it's also testament to the bravery of the casting in it as well, because um, everybody in it is 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 not a name, um, and uh, it's you know it's so it's so well cast, isn't it? It's just really well right. cast, and Perfect. yeah, really yeah, good. I, I, I was just I was just going to say actually. I mean, one of the the reason that I was saying about that it possibly it's benefited from as having the lockdown is mm -hmm. that the one thing that this has shown us is that stuff like, um, the, well, the BBC generally, I think, but also uh, channels like BBC Three, if they didn't exist, that probably would never have been made because there's, because it, it's, it's, I, I mean, I'm just guessing here, I'm surmising, but it, it feels like that was a, that was a, a show that was put together or written or whatever um, and, and produced without pressure without the pressure of we need to get ratings, we need to get... And so I just wonder, and I don't know this, I'm just against surmising, I just wonder whether that that reflects in in the production and the performance, that there isn't that, that you know, your, your LA productions or, you, you know, not that I'm saying there's anything wrong with any of that, but mm -hmm. when there's that pressure there to produce something that mm -hmm. is going to be, you know, get, yeah. get the numbers in. Um, yeah. And there is a worry with, the, you know, with all the funding stuff for the BBC and, and what have you, um, that that type of show won't be made anymore. I think you're right. Um, sorry, I, it's 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 a it's a conversation that's been happening in film for a long time um, in terms of distribution and what ends up on what platform. And the weird thing is, is is how the the breakdown of money occurs when you release things theatrically so you have to hit a certain amount of people per screen basically so you'll get some distributors who will limit the amount of screens a particular film is on so they can hit that count because if they did it in a normal thing then you'd have less people per screen and all that kind of stuff um and so production companies and i'm talking about the big production companies you know the big four kind of the sony paramount all those um they just won't risk a theatrical release without particular names, a particular IP, and it's something which, for the past 10 years, there's been a lot of kind of backlash against in cinema, in those conversations uh, with, it, with cinema makers and with fans of cinema and critics, because they're seeing the same thing play out again and again and again. And it's exactly kind of my worry for stuff which will happen post-lockdown, because everybody's going to have that constraint everybody's going to have that reduced budget everybody's going to have that reduced amount of time and they need a hit so you're going to see those big names and those ips coming onto the small screen and i'm not sure what it's going to do i possibly think we might see a slight change in cinema in the in um, theatrical releases because i think they're going to try something new and drastic some of the companies I think somebody's they're going to throw a, a couple of films which were maybe going to be small theatrical releases straight onto a streaming platform. I think they're just going to go, do you know what? We haven't spent 200 million on this. We've spent 50. And I think the Joker film has got a lot to do with this as well because that's tried and tested because that was a $50 million film that has made a billion dollars. And I think there's going to be a little bit of a switch, partly driven by an audience as well because I don't think audiences really want to go in and watch World War Z sequels and things that are really dour and oppressive i think people are going to want to go see 
a rom-com and i think people are going to mm. want to go see a road movie or an interesting horror or tarantino tarantino's not had the releases which he should have done since probably inglorious bastards because people it's because it's not batman because it's not marvel and cinema chains are going no thanks i need something else so i think there's going to be a slight change well that's really interesting because and i can't remember who said it but so they, they, uh, i was listening to um a debate on this and somebody said that they felt the only movies big movies that were going to be made sort of in the next you know after in the next 10 15 years the only really big movies would be comic book movies that would be it everything else will be yeah. low big budgets yeah. everything else will be lower budgets um almost indie like and um, so that's really interesting you say that but just before we before we move on because you've almost really nicely segued us into the next question mike it's almost as if we know what we're doing almost <laughs> almost <laughs> what are your thoughts and hopes and fears about you know what the industry will look like do you know what? I, I have no idea what it's going to look like. I've got to be honest. It just it, It's such a, uh, an unprecedented moment, isn't it? I don't think we've ever been through anything like this before. Um, what what I do hope is that we... The, the place I look... I've always, I know you've worked there, Liz, as well, but one of my happiest, happiest places I've ever worked is Oldham Colise- Coliseum. I loved working there. I've worked there several times and I've loved it. And I think one of the things is it it listens to what its community wants to see as well as test what the community might want to see. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, um, it, it, it sort of knows its audience and, and it, it's, from my own experience anyway, when, when I was there, it was, it was always fairly full. So... I don't know. I think we just need to. I think I think the government's got to help out, surely. I mean, it feels to me a bit like the Second World War when, when the Arts Council was set up. It's almost like you yeah. need something to support. Yeah. Um, what is essentially one of our biggest contributors to the economy. We need help. You know. Yeah. Um, the thing of theatre that I, I'm so sad about, which is going on a different point, I think. But it's funny. I was doing a, a talk with a, a friend of mine the other day, Karen Henthorne, for our students, <clears throat> and I was really blessed to be in the very, very last days of rep so my first job was at Northampton Royal Theatre and I did a year there then I went to Derby Playhouse then I went and I'd love in the future to allow young actors coming out to have that experience that I had Mm. and to be able to do your craft there how likely do you I mean just bearing in mind sort of what Mike's point about about cinema which I think is is probably a similar point to and I know it, it, it counts more to the larger theatres, but, you know, as soon as we reopen, what Birmingham Hippodrome are probably going to do is get as many stars into a show as they possibly can so they can they can put bums on seats. That mm. that doesn't help. And obviously we're going to come to Sabre in a moment. It doesn't help. It doesn't help me as a jobbing actor because I won't get those roles. It, do, it yeah. certainly doesn't help new grads. And I just wonder what you, I think you're right about the rep. And I think what was what was really encouraging actually before lockdown was it was starting to move in that direction Mm -hmm. a little bit. There was starting to become those opportunities and are those opportunities going to be afforded? Are they going to be there? I just don't know. I have no idea. I would in my, with my optimistic head, I hope so. I hope that, I don't know. I'm hoping that the mood will be that given we've been through such an unprecedented difficult time that we might come out the other side and go, do you know what? Let's push money into this. Let's, let's, I really fancy going to the theater now. I wouldn't have gone before, but do you know what? I'm going to go. Um, yeah. but, but at the same time, I think it is up to theaters to listen to its communities, to listen yeah. to its, you know, the, the, I just think that's really important. This, I think there's, I don't know. There's always theaters that don't seem to do that sometimes. And I think you've got to. Yeah. Um, you need that balance to get um, to get people into to sit down and, and into the theatres now when they could sit at home and watch Netflix. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, you, you just touched on the students, um, and and I'm just wondering whether any of this will change the way that that drama schools teach the way you know what what happens to and you know as as a current tutor. 
um, at drama school. What, what do you, what's your thoughts on that? I mean, are, have you had any conversations about that? Gosh, yeah, we've been in nothing but meetings about it, you know, of how we're going to teach and what we're going to do. And um, because we're quite fortunate that 50% of the, it's changed now, Lee, since you were there, but the curriculum's different. So it's 50% screen now. Yeah. Um, and if anything, uh, as we can see through Emmerdale and Corrie going back, it's probably the easiest to kind of do safely yeah. or safer in a safer environment. Mm. So I think I think we'll, things will accommodate and we'll will will accommodate these changes absolutely. And um, I think we might get some really great interesting things. If, uh, uh, so you know we had students, for example, for their second year, make a, a whole kind of um, lockdown film. Uh, in their own homes for their second year project. So there's some really exciting things can come of it. I mean, there's going to be some things that are a pain in the neck, but there's, you know, I think we are thinking of it and trying to think how we can move forward with it. Yeah. I th to be honest with you, I think it's, it's for me, it's the same conversation. When you're leaving, you, you, it's so precarious anyway, isn't it? I'm sure you know, you just come out, you know, you know what it's like. It's, 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 um, it is the same kind of conversations, except you're saying, look, it, it, it can be tough out there. You know, it's it, it's it probably even tougher. But in some ways, it's given people an independence and autonomy to think, do you know what? If I can do that on Zoom, what else could I do? Yeah. Where else could I go? What else could I make? And um, I think one of the things we sort of say now that drama, it used to be this thing, didn't it, that people came out of drama school and thought, no, I'm going to wait for an agent. I'm going to wait for a job. And I think one of the things we've always sort of said to actors recently is don't wait for that. Get something written, get something down, get a pub, get a room, get it on, get something filmed, get out with your mate. You, you know, you, yeah. people are making films on the phones. More importantly, use each other. You're each other's allies. You'll never have that, you know, once you leave that drama school and you sit on your own, it's really difficult. Don't forget about each other. Use each other. Don't forget them and yeah. keep moving forward together. Yeah. That always resonates with me that I kind of go out and do it just just pick up a thing make it um one of my absolute idols um the guy who i probably wouldn't be sat here now if i'd not paid attention to him is an american director kevin smith who oh, I love kevin Smith. um yeah. the, it's a quite a well-known story of his first film clerks that he'd gone to vancouver film school um was promised that they would be making films and he was sat in a classroom and he went do you know what if i leave now i get five grand back off my tuition fees i'm going to go home i'm going to write a script and i'm going to make it and at about that time robert rodriguez had come out with uh, el mariachi uh, which was a film made for 2000 i think it was 2000 or 27 or something like that and it, the, he had a, a book called rebel without a crew and in there he says don't write films that you can't do so don't write a sci-fi if you've got five hundred dollars write about what you have in your house and kevin smith sat there behind a, a convenience store um selling you know pints of milk to to the locals and he's like i've got a store so he wrote clerks and clerks really? was made for twenty seven thousand dollars he sold at can uh, sorry uh, um the other big Vancouver. film festival it might have been um sold there to to miramax and he's made 10 movies and his his mantra is just like why not be a why not person just push whimsy yeah. just just get out there and go do you know what i'm gonna i'm gonna say i'm gonna do this and then if enough people like it that idea we're gonna go with it because that means there'll be an audience for it and yeah. it's such an important lesson i think if you're in the creative industry is to is to not wait for anything Never, Absolutely. never wait for somebody to knock on your door because nobody's coming knocking because they're knocking on bigger people's doors. Absolutely, I know. I know that um, we know Andy Ellis, who's in This Is England, and um, one of the things that Shay Meadows says, "Well, don't send me the scripts. You've got a phone in your hand. Go make, go, just go make some, you know, create some scenes." Go and get it sorted. And I think there's a lot to be said for that. I mean, when agents go, when actors go to showcase, they always come on and say, oh, we've had this person, oh, we didn't have that there, or what an agent. And I say, it's not the agent you need to worry about. It's anybody, it's a director, a casting agent that's out there. Don't don't worry about an agent. Mm. It's it, it's get a job, get some work, get yeah. someone to see you. And mm. um, I think it's the greatest thing to do, really, personally. Um, that's, that's what I'd suggest, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Saba, what about from a graduate's point of view? Again, it's kind of hard to think about because I'm constantly asking that question. Like, 
what is the industry going to be like? And I think the whole industry is still trying to figure it out. And I noticed in the past year, things that like auditions, a lot of my auditions were self tapes. And I think that's definitely going to carry on. Mm. Definitely going to carry on using Zoom. Um, but for theatre, it's interesting what you've said. They'll just go with the big names to put bums on seats. And I think that's so true. And it's kind of like we've gone backwards again because, again, you mentioned how I feel like uh, new actors were sort of getting more opportunities. And I felt that as well. Um, but I don't know if that's still going to be there when we sort of come back. I think it might take a while to get back to that place. Mm. Um, but it's kind of hard to know. I, I'm, I'm just, I don't really know what else to think on it. Interestingly, you were saying about, um, there's there's the thing about sort of getting celebrities, but there's also the thing about programming. And I think, um, you know, Marie was just talking about Oldham Coliseum and the, the play that I was in, of course, um, so you came to see it and yes. and we yeah. had a chat afterwards. But um, but that's that was quite brave programming for Oldham. Um, right. And uh, and I think it worked. Hopefully that can continue, that, yeah. that they can continue being brave like that. And they probably need to you think you know a lot of people are writing their own stuff in lockdown and there's going to be all this sort of new stuff that people are want to get out there and i guess people might be more open to sort of viewing new things so i think as you said traditional is probably a safe option maybe new writing is a bit of a risk but i think people want something new after just being stuck in the home you know? i think there's um <laughs> I think, I think yeah. there's a, there's an opportunity for me. Yeah. Um, th- there's an opportunity to, rather than you writing going into traditional buildings and tradition, uh, in kind of on the spirit of what we were just talking about. There's a like you say there's there's so many people who have who have graduated or are within the first five years of their career who are thinking what where am I going, and I, I hope enough of those people, exactly as as you were saying, Marie, kind of find another venue find another outlet whether it's filmed whether it's on youtube whether it's streamed on twitch whether it's in a back room of a pub whether it's at a bus stop in gipton and i kind of hope that that's where we end up and i know there are companies out there which do that kind of stuff and and kind of do push the boundaries but i think there needs to be a lot more of it and i think possibly there's there's a my hope post covid for theater and i'm saying this as somebody who's not you know, I've I've acted in theatre. I've been to theatre. I've not really acted for a very long time in theatre. So my knowledge of of the current thing is based entirely on Lee's experience. I'm always of the opinion that change is um, is constantly happening, and we always have to accept it, and we always have to move into it, and we always have to wholeheartedly just go yes, yes, yes to everything. So I signed with an agent on the back of my showcase. Um, we did a showcase in Manchester and London, and I ended up going with the the London agent. And from then, um, I had quite a few auditions coming through, and I, and it looked quite promising and. The audition I was getting, it's like a lot of them were stuff that I was so interested, you know, really eager to get the part. And I thought, you know what, it's great just to be seen for these roles. And I thought, you know, the more I'm seen, the more of a chance I've got. And then the start of this year was a, a little quiet compared to last year. And then obviously lockdown happened and it, it was just barely anything. And I thought, oh. I thought I would, you know, I think everyone thought 2020 is the year and I kind of thought, you know what, I've done a year of auditioning, next year, this year is going to be the year and it's kind of like, you just don't really know, do you? Um, It was a scary time finishing drama school and not being constantly, you know, in the room, tutors around you and you're kind of on your own and you're like, oh, okay, what now? Um, But it was also exciting, but... I guess during lockdown, I've also sort of tapped into opportunities that I wouldn't have thought about doing. If I want to be on the side of positivity, which I do, um, if that was what it was like for you, because it's it's not like that for all people who graduate, you know, Mm, if that's what it was like for you where, you know, you're getting in the room and you're doing, you know, you're you're more than halfway there and there is no reason whatsoever why, you know, when everything just slowly starts to trickle back in that that will go back to it. 
um, go yeah. back to how it was. So that yeah, no, that's that's really encouraging to hear. It's kind of hard, you know, just thinking, oh, is it is it ever going to be like that again? Is it going to be harder? But I've tried to make lockdown positive with the acting. Um, I mentioned before, I've done a lot of these com- acting competitions and it's been really good practice whilst being at home. I mean, why not? Like work on a bit of scripts, work on filming, work on doing a script last minute, only having like a few days to work on it. So again, I'm trying to make the most of it. What I was just about to say, actually, in response to you saying about um, being seen for roles, my strike rate is quite high, which is good because it has to be. Because <laughs> 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 if it wasn't, I'd be, I'd be buggered. <laughs> Do you have a favourite moment, a favourite industry moment? You know what? I really enjoyed doing my showcase at drama school. Um, it was just a weird sort of because we did a final show as well and I loved that but doing the showcase it was just quick two minute two two minute scenes and then you choreograph how you're moving the chairs tables everything you're watching each other and it was just quite an exciting time to be in front of industry so we've got all the casting directors agents and we worked so hard together as a group we all supported each other so much and it was just a really positive time, I think. Mm. Um, so I guess that's one of my favourites. Favourite moment, Marie? Um, I've, I've got I've got two really because one stage and one screen. And my favourite stage thing was doing brass stuff at Oldham Coliseum. Um, it just meant uh, it, I've never been happier. And I'd had a particularly miserable time before it on another job, and it, it knocked my confidence quite a bit. I went to that job and. I was just with these brilliant people, Steve Hewison, Ian Kershaw, these fantastic people in in something that um, I've always loved the film Brastoff and um, I've always loved uh, that story. Mm. And we had a different brass band from all around the region every week. And just oh, wow. to be on that stage with that music and that, that story was just amazing. And I don't think I've ever been happier. And then my second one uh, for telly was definitely in the flesh. It was such a lovely bunch of people. Again, just, there was no names apart from a couple of people. And uh, it was just a bunch of people with no egos that cared for each other, that were fun, that we had a laugh and we loved the work, but we didn't take ourselves too seriously. And um, I felt very blessed, very, very lucky. Um, so, yeah, they're my two highlights. One of the reasons that that's one of my highlights um, is that that car, I, that I had to get into a, the, like this classic Saab. And um, at the time, I had a a car that had an ele- electronic handbrake. So as soon as you just put your foot down and lifted the clutch, the, the handbrake came off. Of course, this didn't. And so the first time I got in it, I didn't take the handbrake off and I set off forwards and there were a guy who owned the car was sort of was stood in front of you. you could just see him he was going he was going oh no what are you doing? <laughs> so I was just driving forward with the handbrake smoke oh. back then. Anyway, <laughs> you would and that actually that's another another quite early lesson for me um in camera work was that things that you expect to be really easy like getting in a car and driving <laughs> as soon as they say action absolutely <laughs> It's really difficult. It's really, I always say to students, the worst acting I ever do is door acting. <laughs> the minute I've got to answer a door, and it can literally be like, open Jenny. I don't know what the name is. I've forgotten the name. <laughs> I, 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 every single time, I become an absolute incompetent. <laughs> Yeah. Good, amazing. Okay, look, I, I know time is absolutely cracking on, but I've got one last question for you both. What has been your vice? during lockdown oh god my vice um wine <laughs> <laughs> quite simply wine. <laughs> uh, how, how much wine are we talking are we talking uh, well do you know what i've moderated it but I, I i i try to you know um stick to weekends normally but it has crept into weeks because there's been quite a few zoom quizzes and you know <laughs> <laughs> sometimes it's just zoom quiz just isn't the same without something in your hand is it so um yeah <laughs> when you say you've tried to moder- moderate it is that a recent thing that you felt that like you had to moderate it or have you tried to moderate it from the beginning 
No, no. I just noticed when I was doing quizzes, and the, I'm sure we're all the same, uh, and on Zooms, all of a sudden, you just felt you had to be, it was like being in a pub, so you had to have something with you. So I just kept thinking, oh, you know what? Because I, I, I don't want to drink at weekends and stuff, really. But then I just found them creeping in on Mondays and Tuesdays. So I think that's definitely been my advice. I've been drinking a bit too much, as more than I should. <laughs> Fair enough. Have you been working, though, throughout? Have you been furloughed or...? We've been we've been on Zoom. We've been Zoom doing right. all stuff on Zoom. Yeah. So um, yeah. So that's been interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yes, yeah, so we have been working. Yeah. Sabo, what's your advice been? Advice? Maybe something similar. I guess. I guess gin. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Gin. Gotta be. Tins of gin, can't you? And it's just so tempting. You crack a little one open, and you're like. Oh. Just enjoy yeah. a little gin on the side, but love that. Yeah. Just skip, yeah. skip the wine straight to the gin. Yeah. yeah. But you know what? I actually thought of a quick answer to the question you asked before. One of your favourite acting moments. Um. So I did a short film, and it was filmed on the Todmorden Moors, yeah. and it was kind of like um, Game of Thrones style. Um. And stage combat at drama school, and I thought. I hope I get to use these skills one day and then lo and behold this film opportunity came up and I was like yes I've got stage combat skills Brilliant. and it was so fun we had like amazing costume and we like choreographed the scenes and it was a lovely sunny day but it was it got so cold like towards the end of the day but mm. um it was really fun you know there was like fake blood like just everything about it I just thought this this is acting like I just loved it. I just thought I'd throw it in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can, we there? Can we see it? What, is it has it been released? Is it getting released? What what? So the director is still in the middle of editing it, but there's a tiny little clip of it on my showreel actually. Um, oh. My showreel is uh, pinned to my tweet to my Twitter. Listen, <laughs> thank you very much indeed for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, um, thank you for asking me. Thank you. No, no, thank you, thank you, thank you both. Fun. Um, I hope everything uh, turns out okay with everything that we we've all got our fingers crossed and everything, yeah. and I'll yeah. see you on the other side. Yeah. Thank you. So yeah, lovely thanks. to see you all. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank, Bye. You. Bye. Thank, Thank you, guys. Oh, what? A, oh, how lovely was that? Yeah, I, I really liked that because we had, um, you know, having Sabra on, and she's, you know, months into a professional career. Um, yeah. It's a really interesting take, isn't it? And it's a really interesting. I mean, we've had people on who've had 50 year careers and now we've got somebody with a absolutely you know you go from from uh you know reese dinsdale with his vast career and um, lewis emmerich whose yeah. birthday it is actually. yeah happy birthday um, happy birthday lewis uh yeah and then uh, because I, I i have been keen over the last few weeks to try and get um a younger demographic actually just <laughs> you know what i mean yeah because not just Two Not 40 year old men are really hip with the kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, no, but from from that perspective, because oh, yeah, yeah. you know, you talk about um, uh, actors and creatives who were young in their career, careers, and um, and getting their perspective on it and their hopes and fears, and that's that's really really interesting. Thanks to um, Saba and Marie. Um, if Atari want to sponsor us, please do. <laughs> Can I get it on? Yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. There will be another um, podcast released this week. Who's on this week's podcast? Um, I believe it's episode seven, which is released this week, which was our chat with Rebecca Ryan. Oh, and yes. That, that was a good one, that, because, um, <laughs> you know, I really liked learning about um, Charlie still being in Casualty when I thought he'd left years ago. <laughs> Yeah, do you know what? It's funny. I was watching that this week, and it was that was one of the bits where you sort of went. Uh, I said, "Do you watch Casualty?" And you said, "Oh well, yeah, I used to do, but Charlie left." So, you, no, 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 he's still in it. <laughs> uh, please like, please subscribe, uh, give us a five star review. Go over to um, iTunes and download the podcast. That would be good. Subscribe and stuff. Thanks very much for watching. See you next week. Uh, roll credits. We'll